All right. I think we're recording now. Okay. Um, Beth Dula Forest here with Aspire Insurance Group and DogOnInsurance.com. And thank you for joining us with a converse, for a conversational series on what is a responsible dog owner. So this term is thrown around a lot. I hear it in many different circles when they're describing uh, an owner, but what does it really actually mean? And I think depending on the circle that you're in, it can mean different things and different things to different people. So I have a lineup of people that I know, like, and trust um, to just dialogue with me about their experience um, and how they would define a responsible dog owner. And so today I have Sarah Lindquist. I think I've known her since like 2005, mm -hmm. yeah. I think, yeah. yep. Um, and Sarah has an amazing, vast background in all things dog related. And so I'm going to have, um, Sarah, if you want to just kind of give a little bit of background just to kind of um, set the stage for when we are discussing responsible ownership. Sure. So just in terms of my background, so when I was living in Boston um, back in, gosh, the early 2000s, I started volunteering at the city of Boston Animal Shelter. And that is kind of where I got into rescue and where all of this started for me. Um, one of the things in Boston at the time was that pit bulls, you could not, um, pit bulls specifically, you could not adopt in the city of Boston, which I thought was interesting because it was the city of Boston shelter and they wouldn't let you adopt out pit bulls um, to anyone living in the city. And so they sort of became my, I became their champion a little bit. I fell in love with, the, especially the pit bulls um, and really just got to know the breed and, and just rescue in general. I think just shelter, shelter dogs, that sort of thing. Um, and then when I moved to Minnesota in 2004, I realized I wanted to continue doing that work. So whether it was volunteering um, with a local shelter, with an animal rescue, and I wanted to get a pit bull as well. I hadn't had a pit bull before that. So that is how we met in 2005 um, through a Rada Love Plus. I adopted my first pit bull, Rose, through a Rada Love and had her for about 10 years. And she was a fantastic ambassador for the breed. And really just kind of started my love of all things rescue, all things pit bull. Um, and then over the years, I have my, myself and then my husband and I have owned um, several pit bulls. So since 2005 and having Rose, I've since then, I've never not had a pit bull. Um, so Rose was certainly the one that started that. And then I started volunteering for the Minneapolis Animal Shelter, uh, Minneapolis Animal Care and Control in 2012. Um, and started volunteering with Arata Love in 2005 when I got Rose. So I was volunteering with Arata Love and then picked up the Mac shifts starting in 2012. And I've been there ever since. Um, so yeah, so, you know, long background in rescue and, and shelter dogs and animal behavior and shelters and, and all of that good stuff. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm the same. I, since I had a pit bull, I've never not had a pit bull. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, it's like once you get one, right? You just, yeah, I, I just fell in love with them um, just as a, you know, and, and kind of their underdog status and, you know, Same. all of the, all of the messaging around them. Um, I felt like I needed to advocate for them. And so it's been, it's been good. We've had some really, really great dogs. We've fostered dogs. We've um, all the ones that we've gotten have been rescues too. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. I didn't even plan on getting into the breed. I took an online test. I don't know if I ever shared the story with you, but I I took an online test that said because I wanted a I wanted a puppy, but I knew that it was really important to match the breed to um like what you would want in a dog. Yeah. So almost like an online dog matchmaker Match. quiz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it came up as American Staffordshire Terrier. No way which is super funny. And I don't know exactly what that says about me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I started, that's literally how I, it, you know, and those of you who might not know American Stafford Terrier Terriers, the AKC version of a UKC would be a pit bull. Basically, that's all just one big general term. Yeah. Um, you know, there's like 20 some breeds that fall under the general term of pit bull. So anyway, um, yeah, I just, that's, that's how it started for me. But as soon as I started really experiencing the um I guess you, I mean for lack of it really it's discrimination but when I started experiencing it that just really is something that's like 
hits a soft spot in me. I always mm-hmm. like advocacy is really important to me. Yeah. And so that's what kind of pointed me down the rescue mm-hmm. direction. So yeah. 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 Great. Well, so um I I'm really curious to hear from you. You have a lot of experience, especially I love that you, your experience in rescue is near and dear to my heart. But your experience with Minnesota Animal Care Control, which is mm-hmm. an animal control in Minneapolis, um it is really um it, you know that brings a whole different aspect of ownership because you're mm-hmm. seeing dogs that are surrendered dogs that are taken from families dogs that are stray like that type of thing so um your perspective I'm excited to hear what how what would you use as a description for a responsible dog owner? sure so I think just on a very fundamental level kind of a basic level you know caring for your animal, right? Giving it shelter, feeding it, loving it. Um, You know, those are kind of the things I think we generally think of when we think about being a good dog owner or, you know, um, a responsible dog owner. But I think it goes farther than that. I think it's really about being able to advocate for your dog. It's being able to understand your dog's personality, their behaviors, their preferences, their you know, what situations they're good in, what they're not, um, how they communicate with you, their, their language, how they're speaking to you. So, you know, for example, I had a, we had a dog that really did not like other dogs. She just, she was fine with dogs in our house, but when you took her outside, she was not good with other dogs. And so we just, we didn't set her up for those situations where she was around other dogs. So she spent, you know, she didn't go we walked her and all of that, but she didn't go out to breweries and she didn't go out to restaurants and things like that because we knew it was not a comfortable space for her. And so I think really being able to know your dog, um, set them up for success, not put them in situations where, right, you know, something could happen. Um, And so she was a good example of that. So I think really just understanding on a deeper level, your dog versus yes, it's of course, you want to give them shelter and love and all of those things. But it's also being able to speak up for your dog, not put them in situations that are not comfortable for them. um, And just advocating them advocating for them overall. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. One of the things that I wrote down when when you were talking was I, I agree the advocacy thing is is a really big deal. I think a lot mm-hmm. of people just kind of put their dogs out there and their dogs are left to their own devices, but they mm-hmm. don't have devices. They don't have a way to communicate. And a lot of people do not um, know how to look at a dog and, uh, and understand through the behavior if they're uncomfortable, if they're stressed, if they're, mm-hmm. even if they're enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times, you know, just the difference in a tail wag can mean I'm mm-hmm. freaking out right now or I'm relaxed and I'm happy yep. or a, a smile can be like I'm stressed out like crazy mm-hmm. or I'm relaxed and this is really mm-hmm. you know my jive like mm-hmm. so what are some of the ways that you've learned to read your dogs or some of the kind of tried and true ways like when you're in um, animal control and you're meeting a new dog that you're really noticing or ways that you're reading a dog. Sure. So I think just overall sort of posture stance, um, you know, are they, are they wagging, having kind of that soft tail wag where they're, you know, they're, they're comfortable, they're relaxed. Um, licking lips is a big one. Um, a lot of times and yawning, that's a big one that I hear say, Oh, the dog's just tired. The dog's not tired. Uh, maybe the dog is tired, but that's not what they're communicating. They're communicating that they're uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, y- y- I see situations where, you know, for example, kids are tugging on a dog's ear or they're riding on a dog's back. Um, not obviously in the shelter, um, but, you know, in in Facebook posts and things like that, where it's pretty obvious, certainly to me, it doesn't mean it is to everyone else, that the dog is not comfortable, right? And so because they can't speak, that is how they communicate. So if they're yawning, if they're licking their lips, if they have a stiff tail, if they have that hard stare, Mm -hmm. um, or if they're looking away or, you know, they're kind of laying down and and looking away, right. Just on any of those things that say, I'm not comfortable and give me my space and leave me alone. The big things is letting a dog come to you. Right. So Mm -hmm. we have a volunteer room at Mac where we can spend time with the dogs. And so we'll bring the dog in, take it off the leash um, and go sit in a chair and just let the dog do what it's going to do. Right. We're not in its face 
saying, oh, hey, let me pet you. It's let me sit back and see what the dog does. And then a lot of cases, they will come up, they'll jump up and they'll want pets and they'll, right, they'll be giving off that body language that they're comfortable. But there are plenty of shy, especially at Mac, we get a lot of the shy and scared dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and they may show that fear by raising their lips and growling. And it doesn't mean they're an aggressive dog, right? It means that they're yeah. telling me I'm not comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. Please back off. And, and it doesn't mean they're not going to get to that point. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's important. It's really important to look for those things up front. So you don't, again, crowd a dog that's not comfortable because if they growl and you don't listen to them, their next step is going to be to bite because you said, they said, I growled at you. I told you, and you didn't listen to me. So this is my yeah. next. So um, we really, especially in the shelter environment, because so many of the dogs are strays or we don't know where they've come from um, or what their situations were, you have to handle them. You know, you have to be particularly particularly vigilant and mindful and looking for those behaviors. Yeah, especially in, you know, shelter, animal control environments, like that mm -hmm. is the height of stress. Yes, 100%. Like that is, you know, yeah. so you're seeing them, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, you're you're seeing seeing them and you're handling them in a time where they're the most insecure, fearful. So any if all the behaviors are will be amplified. Or I can imagine then you have some that just completely shut down. Shut down. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Yeah, that's very interesting. Um tell me what you're seeing in, you know, when you see dogs that are coming in from animal control. Mm -hmm. Um one of the things that I that I really feel like I've noticed is behavior can be also determined a lot by the health of an animal. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not really engaged in making sure that our dogs are eating properly and getting the proper health care that they need to, mm -hmm. like that can really change mm -hmm. um, our, the dog's behavior. So have you, you know, given that you're seeing dogs that are coming maybe they've been astray for a long time or they've been in a household that was maybe struggling and it was the dog had to eat or the family, you know, what are, how are you seeing a health impact behavior of dogs? Mm -hmm. So at Mac, I think the vet staff does a really great job at intake of kind of diagnosing and looking and seeing what's going on. And so they're tending to address a lot of those things up front, but that doesn't mean that when we're working as volunteers with the animals that, you know, they maybe hurt their paw or they are in pain somewhere or something is going on that we don't know about. And I think that you you tend to see that with with behaviors, right? If they're in pain, if they're uncomfortable, um, the very basic example I use is if a dog hurts its paw, right? And you go to touch its paw or go near its paw, it may growl at you because it's telling you, don't touch me there, right? Because I'm I'm injured or I'm hurt. And so I think when you see some of those, those behaviors, right, the growling, that, that sort of thing, considering also, is there a medical issue behind that? Because in instances, it certainly is going to be a factor, right? If, a, again, they can't tell us how they're feeling. They can't tell us, oh, my shoulder hurts, right? Or my paw hurts or, you know, any number of medical things that are going on. And so, again, I think it's, they're just trying to tell us something that is, um, that, that we don't know about. And in a lot of cases, right. With, with health, you don't know what's, going on. um, mm -hmm. we've had plenty of dogs come through Mac that have, you know, masses on their body, right. Whether those are, you know, cancerous or not, um, things like that, or, um, cherry eye is another one where, where we see not, mm -hmm. not super common, but we see that in dogs there. And so, you know, medical issues and ones that you just don't know about, right. You know, when they're on the street and strays, maybe they get in a fight with another dog. Maybe they get hit by a car. We've had multiple dogs that have had old bullet wounds. Um, mm -hmm. don't know until they do x-rays or, you know, find out what's yeah. going on. So I think it's just important to keep in mind sometimes if, you know, if a dog is acting behaviorally in a certain way, it doesn't mean they're an aggressive dog or it doesn't mean that, you know, it's something fundamental, you know, there's something fundamentally um, going on. It could be a medical issue as well. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you touched on um, with, was advocacy mm -hmm. and um, kind of setting up the environment for your dog to succeed, but also being willing to, you know, protect them when you're out and about mm -hmm. with them. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a dog that's maybe not friendly with other dogs, or maybe it's fearful with strangers, or maybe you're just working on training and you don't want distraction. 
And there's a, there can be so many reasons why we don't necessarily want um, our animals to interact with mm-hmm. the, with the outside at mm-hmm. any given moment, right? And I think that for a lot of people, the idea of advocating for your animal mm-hmm. sounds new, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I know for me, it was something I had to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was maybe uncomfortable for me for a little bit. Um, it's not anymore. Mm-hmm. But what I think it'd be fun to kind of dialogue. What are some things that you have that you do mm-hmm. or that you say mm-hmm. um, when you're out and about with your dogs, or even when you're in your home, to mm-hmm. set up your environment for your dog to succeed or mm-hmm. to advocate in a way where you're protecting your dog. I think mm-hmm. this would be interesting for people to listen to because sometimes if you agree with an idea, like, yeah, I want to advocate for my dog. Oh my gosh, my dog is mm-hmm. uncomfortable when mm-hmm. it meets up, when we're going to be approaching another dog on the street too. And the, the person's walking with a loose leash mm-hmm. and not paying attention to their dog and my dog's going to be uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to recognize that and to say, I agree, we should advocate. It's a whole different skill set than to know what to do. And and so I think talking about that might give people some ideas of what they could do. So what are some things that you've done? Mm -hmm. Sure. So as I say, in my general life, I'm not a particularly assertive person. I'm much more passive. Um, And so it was something I had to learn with with my dogs and especially the breed breed that I have, right? Yeah. Pit bulls. Um, and so one of the examples I use or one of the things that, you know, really kind of gave me a chance to, I guess, practice those assertiveness skills. Um, I was living in San Diego about 10 years ago and I had Rose, my first pit bull, and we were out on a walk. And I remember a gentleman with his dog was walking behind us and walking very close. I mean, close enough where he was letting his dog sniff Rose's, Rose's butt. Um, and he continued to do this for probably about a half a block or so. And I finally just turned around and said, you know, excuse me, can you please back up and give us some space? And his response was, well, my dog likes other dogs, so it's fine. Um, and you know, to me, which was so interesting, right? Because it's, you know, yes, you may know your dog and your dog might be great with most other dogs, but you don't know my dog. So you don't know what my dog is going to do. And the last thing I wanted, you know, and Rose was very good with other dogs, Um, She had a thing where she didn't like huskies for whatever reason. This was not a husky, Um, but otherwise she was good with other dogs. And so, you know, it wasn't an issue from the standpoint of, I felt like she was going to do anything, but that potential was still there. Right. And so, you know, if if that dog continued to bother her, you know, just imagine she turned around and snapped right at the dog's face to, to tell the dog, this is not comfortable for me, please stop then we have a bite on our hands and she's a pit bull, right? And so I think just recognizing, um, you know, being able to say to him, and and I think what I learned was, it's hard for me to be assertive for myself. It's easier for me to be assertive on behalf of my animal, right? Because it's, mm-hmm. I'm trying to protect the safety of my animal, but I'm trying to protect your safety too. And your, your maybe your animal's safety. So it's it's really just in the best interest of everyone to know and to speak up and say, you know, my dog's not comfortable in this situation. Um, another mm-hmm. thing is I just took our most recent rescue um, to training and the trainer was great. She said, you know, you can go into Home Depot and places like that. And if someone comes up and says, can I pet your dog? You can respectfully say, you know, thank you for offering, but we're training right now. And so, right. And so you can speak up and say those things. And and I think most people will respect that. I think you know, it's, but it's on us to speak up and say something because Mm -hmm. how many times have you walked down the street and said, Oh, look at that cute dog. Um, one of the women I volunteer with at max, she's wonderful. She, every time she sees a dog, she asks the owner if she can pet their dog. Um, so I think really just thinking about that versus just assuming, Oh, it's a dog and dogs like to be pet and let me just run up and and pet the dog. Um, being able that. So I think really just being assertive on behalf of the animal, even when it's hard for me to do it for myself, um, is just in the best interest of certainly protecting my dog and then protecting other people. Um, and especially in the shelter environment, right? If we're, if I'm on a walk with a shelter dog, it's not my dog. So yeah, I don't right. know situations that dog may or may not be comfortable. And it's a little bit different when it's your own dog and you know, generally kind of what their preferences are and things like that. But in a shelter situation, you don't. And so it's mm-hmm. really been that much more important to say, 
you know, you know, and, and Mac is in such a place where it's not highly populated. So we don't run into that often, but if you do being able to say, you know, this is not, this is not my dog. I'm not sure, you know, what they're comfortable with. So respectfully, um, please give us our space. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's really good. There's a, I'll share a couple of things that I've done, mm -hmm. um, is like in my home, mm -hmm. I, well, I will most oftentimes just have my dog put away. I, yes, us too. Mm -hmm. I don't really like them interacting with other people unless it's someone who's very familiar with dogs mm -hmm. and, um, and can set some good boundaries. Cause mm -hmm. I've just, I also have learned from a behavioral standpoint too, like they'll tend to just, you know, if they're jumping, like I can't be on the other side of the, you know, the person mm -hmm. that's trying to correct it. So it just ends up being and it sometimes encourages like behaviors I don't want, but mm -hmm. I, but it's also just for everybody involved. I just prefer to let, just put them away. So, mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've really noticed, um, in the past when I've, I have had many moments where there was the my, but my dog likes other dogs. I'm like, it doesn't mean that my dog does, but you kind of almost have to assume that most dog owners are going to be like that. So a lot of times I would just simply like cross the street. Mm -hmm. or I would go over far like into the street or if it, if it was okay like into someone's yard and just do mm -hmm. like a sit have them sit by me for the other mm -hmm. person to pass um I have used for sure the you know we're training right now that type of that type of response to people I mean it's even if you're not training frankly it's a very gentle way of saying no if you're mm -hmm. uncomfortable just to yeah. say no <laughs> yep yep um and also one of the thoughts that I had too is like I've, all different dogs are going to need different um they're going to have different needs from us like I know my dog Abe right now he needs a lot of structure mm -hmm. um so like my my home is very structured you now but I've had other dogs that really just don't really need very much structure sure. Mm -hmm. at all so paying attention to that with your dog mm -hmm. um another I wrote this down when you were talking about how everybody not everybody many people like to you know pet your dog they want to pet your dog mm -hmm. and I love you know asking is just like that's a non-negotiable to me you mm -hmm. cannot just go up to a dog and start petting mm -hmm. them but right now the dog that I have Abe he does not love being pet it mm. actually completely stresses him out. Really? He's fine if, I mean, he does, there's no temperament issues going on there. So nothing would happen, mm -hmm. but his body language and everything about him mm -hmm. tells me like, I am not, this is not my happy place. I'm mm -hmm. not, you know, and he'll be okay with it from me yeah. mm, sometimes, but most of the time he's not loving it. Even hmm. though he's the dog that's like, he is very much Velcro in the sense of like, you can, you cannot leave my eyesight. I want to hmm. be in the room. I want to be by you, you know, but I just don't want people petting me. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. I, this is the first dog I've ever had that's like that. And it's yeah. really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But he sends yeah. like all the stress signals when you start petting him. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and you, what you spoke to earlier, the crossing the street, I've used that a lot of times too. Right. I think sometimes, you know, as much as I'll be assertive when I need to be, there are plenty of times where I just avoid, right? avoid it by going to the other side of the street. Um, or, you know, if a lot of times I use this quite frequently, if another dog is, if I'm not in a position where I can't cross the street for whatever reason, I will move over. Right. I will kind yeah. of pull over, pull off onto the shoulder, as they say, and just, you know, and have my dog on the other side of me yeah. um, and let them pass and then kind of continue. Um, right. That's a big and one. And I usually, when I do that, you know, and they're passing, I usually am working like their attention and mm -hmm. like looking here and mm -hmm. engaging them in a way where um, they're staying with me, like right here. Mm -hmm. They're not like, oh, look at this, you know? Yeah. yeah. So just trying to keep them their minds right here mm -hmm. yep. um so and thankfully that has worked mm -hmm. pretty good but there's also been some dogs where um I had to just keep the their world just kind of small you know mm -hmm. like like sure. you said before like 
Yeah. Some just don't want to go to the breweries and mm-hmm. that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was our dog peanut. I mean, she was, it was very fascinating because she was good. She was good with dogs coming into our house, although we structured it. Right. So she was in the crate and then it was slow, you know, slow intros if, because we would dog sit, things like that. Yeah. Um, but the second you took her out of the house, it was a totally different ball game. It was really fascinating because a lot of times you find it to be different, right? They're protective of their home. They're fine outside. Yeah. Um, she was sort of the opposite. And so, you know, I mean, I remember my husband tried taking her out one time and, and, or actually I think it was both of us. We went to a pizza place and sat outside and we just, after that, it was just, you know, never again, because it was just uncomfortable for everyone. I mean, I was, you know, I was worried about it. The dog was not comfortable. Um, and so it was just kind of a, all right, we're good. Right. She can, she can be in the house and she can meet dogs in the house, but um, mm-hmm. and she can go on walks and things like that, but keeping her world pretty small um, um, was the best thing for her. So, yeah, for sure. And it's funny because not feeling guilty about that because don't mm-hmm. so oftentimes, like I know that I felt guilty, like with, with Abe specifically, mm-hmm. you know, he's been one of the harder dogs that I've had and I love him to pieces, but it's just a completely different rodeo this time with mm-hmm. him. Yeah. And I was feeling bad that I, that I wasn't, um, doing like all the things with him like you know mm-hmm. he's been through confirmation he's been mm-hmm. through, to shows and he's been through obedience and he's mm-hmm. had a couple private training sessions and he's traveled with people to shows and and then at home like I try to do a good job of keeping him engaged and busy mm-hmm. um but there's people that do a lot more than me yeah. and I was you know he his needs are just completely different than Mm -hmm. other dogs. So just not feeling like you're a bad owner if your dog's not going everywhere with you. Or if with him, like he really actually needs really, really consistent structure Mm -hmm. and very like consistency and structure. Like Mm -hmm. he needs that or he becomes just an unruly, he's a year and a half. So he's just naughty. He's like a two-year-old and a teenager (laughs) in one body. And it's just unbelievable. (laughs) But, um, but I had to learn, and I and in the rescue world, this was one thing that I and and I I've talked about this before, but it's I, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it because I don't know if your experience has been this in in rescue. Mm-hmm. They would almost really discourage um, a lot of crate time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a real sensitive like they, they don't want them to be crated much mm-hmm. or as as little as possible. And so I actually had always had that mindset, but then when I was in this other world, like those dogs are created like a lot Mm -hmm. and that that's not bad. I'm learning though, that, that, that isn't bad. They have a purpose. They're Mm -hmm. fulfilled They're It's a different world and different and not meaning different is bad because it's not, Mm -hmm. but it was, I, from that experience was really was able to fully lean into the structure that Abe means, which does not mean he's in his kennel like all the time. But he's mm-hmm. in his kennel more than I would have now. He's in this kennel more now mm-hmm. than he was um before, like when I had that like rescue mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now I look at it more like he's in his bedroom. He's mm-hmm. in his den. He is, mm-hmm. you know, and then I also because before he was so busy that I was almost driving myself nuts because I was like, oh he has to, he can't be he has to be out of his kennel as much as possible but then i was starting to be like dude you're like draining me you know yeah. Yeah. so even sometimes he's in his kennel because like i just need a break you need a space your space yep mm-hmm. yep absolutely yeah. yeah and that's really helped because now i'm like have the freedom to be like nope you need to be in your kennel right now no mm-hmm. you don't need to sleep with us because and before i would have him sleep with me and adam because I was like, oh, he needs to be out of his kennel as much as he can. Mm, and, yeah. and no, actually, yeah. he needs to sleep in his kennel. Mm-hmm, yeah. It's better that he sleeps in his kennel yeah. for a lot yeah. of different reasons. Mm-hmm. But it's funny, like, the different thoughts that we end up having, depending on, like, what area of dog world mm-hmm. you're in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, in crate training, I mean, that is such a huge thing. And I really... I found it, I think where people have struggled is during COVID, right? Because so many people were home and working from home and getting puppies and, 
you know, like, oh, well, we don't. And I've talked, I've talked to people who said, yeah, the dog isn't crate trained because I was home all day. So the dog was out all day. And there, that's a training tool, but that's also a safe space for them, right? To yeah. have their space and to decompress and have downtime. And if they get overstimulated, it's a good place for them to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is there, you know, we're going to reach during COVID, right? We're going to return to a post COVID world. And, and what are you going to do, right? When you leave the house, yeah. the dog has free reign and you come home and has destroyed the house. Yeah. Um, and so there's just, I think, crates are such valuable tools for so many different reasons, right? Um, yep. To give the dog some decompression time, to give you some decompression time for structure. It's a safe space for them um, to protect them, right? So they don't get into something that they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I've seen that, you know, and, and same with separation anxiety. We see that at Mac quite a bit. Um, we have dogs, mm-hmm. that, you know, and you look at the age, right? And they're about two, two and a half. Yeah years old and they have separation anxiety. Um, and you know, you kind of realize <laughs> why that is. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are great tools. Muzzles are the same thing. I mean, muzzles are a lot of times people look and go, Oh, you have a muzzle on your dog. Well, again, if your dog doesn't like going to the vet, if your dog doesn't like other dogs, right. There are a lot of tools and, and reasons to use a muzzle and in positive ways. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Right. And not being, not being afraid to lean into those tools mm-hmm. or to stay curious and ask questions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, cause I, I mean, like, I'm not kidding you. How long have I had? I've had pities for, um, like 20 years mm-hmm. yeah. and, and I was feeling, and I mean, Abe's a year and a half. I literally until probably about six months ago, I was feeling guilty with how much, like, I wouldn't put him in this crate, but I was driving mm-hmm. myself crazy. I yeah. mean, I would put him in, but like, it, like I it would, I would do everything I could to for it to be as minimal as possible. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it actually took the uh, a gal that was helping me with handling Abe um, mm-hmm. for shows. She's super smart, and I'm so thankful for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was like, "He needs more structure. You mm-hmm. need to get. You, he needs to be in his mm-hmm. crate." And I was like, <laughs> I was like. <laughs> you're right yeah you're absolutely right yeah. for him and I because mm-hmm. I was like the boy mm-hmm. is just gonna you know one of us is gonna go off the deep yeah. end too pretty yeah. soon <laughs> yeah. yep yep very cool well thank you so much for your sure. time and um yeah I just feel like we're we're on the same page and it's really fun there's one theme I feel like that's just been popping up mm-hmm. um, over the, like, I have just had one other conversation before I chatted with you and it's been advocacy. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody said it. And, and the, that's kind of the theme, like yeah, the things that we talk of, about around it is mm-hmm. advocacy. Mm-hmm. So, which I kind of think is amazing. So, yeah. um, so again, I appreciate your time.